Um, we will be sharing it uh, so, so you can download it later. And uh, the other thing is that we're very small and scrappy, so uh, we didn't really budget for this. If you want to make a donation, we have a donation page on our site, and we will, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. But we're not doing it for the money, but you know, if you want to help out, it, we would appreciate it. And if you're not on our mailing list, uh, that's on our site too. And what we're going to do today is we're going to, this could take about 50 minutes. And for about 35 or 40 of those minutes, Steve and I are going to sort of lay out a couple of things. Um, and then we will try to respond to those questions. But we know people are in tight schedules, so we'll be ending it at 12 promptly. Um, and we'll let you know when the next one's going to happen as well. So um, the reason we're doing this is uh, because no one really knows what to do right now. I, d I think uh, nobody, ex not many people expected this to happen. Um, statistically, it was very unlikely. Um, and we're in a moment where that I think not very many people planned for. Um, the reasons that it happened are very complex, and the ways that we are going to move forward are going to need to be equally complex. And so we would love to tell you, you know what, this is what we need to do. Um, but it's not going to be that simple. But we do have one sort of guiding principle, uh, which is what we call the first rule of guerrilla warfare, which is to understand our terrain and use it to our advantage. and. The political terrain today, which has been really made obvious by um, Trump's victory and the campaign that he ran, um, is a terrain of story and symbol and sign and spectacle. Um, and we need to learn how to fight on that terrain. Um, if we keep going back to this idea of, well, the facts, once one knows the facts, they're going to have to make the right decisions, no amount of fact checkers could actually stem Donald Trump's progress, that the facts in themselves are not enough. We need to be able to converse on the same sort of spectacular terrain that Donald Trump was able to do. But we need to do it ethically, and we need to do it effectively. Luckily, we have a tool, and that tool is art. Art works on this terrain. And so what Steve and I are really interested in is how we use art, not to express our political passions, although art's good for doing that, but actually how art can intervene in the political process. That is, how can we use art effectively to challenge power? And the good news is, you know, we're, this is how a lot of us are trained. Um, and, and if you weren't trained in the arts, you know, we all have a creative side, so we can tap into this. Um, this also isn't, the, the way that we work is not about best practices. So we're not going to tell you how to do a flash mob and tell you that that's going to fix everything. Um, it's about a different way of thinking about approaching activism. So we're not talking about just using creative creativity to develop tactics, to develop actions that happen in the world. We're talking about using um, creativity to develop a whole strategy, and, th and that's more the focus for, the, for what we're talking about today. And I also want to mention we are going to do these in a series, so this is where we're starting, and periodically we're going to add to it. Yeah. And this is a lot about developing the creative capacities of yourself um, and the people that you work with. And it's about building infrastructure and laying the ground week, groundwork for years to come. Because this is going to be a long struggle. Um, and we've got to actually use as many tools as possible, use as many resources as possible, and maximize our creativity if we're going to fight effectively over these next few years. The other good news is that we've been working over the last few years and we've seen this method work. Um, we've seen it with undocumented immigrants in South Texas and sex workers in South Africa under repressive regimes in Russia and you know some of the most hostile uh, uh, political and social environments for LGBT people in Macedonia and we've seen it work so uh, come along with us and hopefully we can make it work here yeah so what are we gonna do Steve so we're going to cover demystifying the creative process. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the creative process. Um, hopefully this can help you think about how it applies to activism and organizing. And then we're going to look at some common pitfalls in that process. That is, mistakes that people make. Um, and we know these quite well because we make them. Um, and uh, there we go. Uh, yeah. Common pitfalls. Um, and why we have to focus on what we want rather than the problems that are in front of us. That's going to be something we talk about. 
And finally, we're going to talk about sort of where are we now in this whole process and how to think of this as a long-term process. One of the things that Steve and I are very invested in is not thinking of creative activism as a one-off, as uh, just a, a protest gesture, but getting beyond the gesture and thinking about this in terms of long-term campaigns and creative strategies. So you saw this calendar thing here. This is a, what our normal workshop is. It's actually a five-day workshop where we cover a bunch of topics in theory and we go into a ton of detail. We have a few minutes and so like I said we're gonna we we picked this because we thought it would be the most helpful right now and we're gonna do follow-ups as we go along. So let's talk about the um, creative process. I'm gonna switch to a kind of whiteboard here and um, this there's a few people that talk about how the creative process works and sort of breaking it up into steps. Um, they all use different words uh, uh, to describe those steps, but they're remarkably similar. And so we made our own and changed them for us, and we, we gave it a new name. Um, but uh, there's four steps. The first one they call the explorer phase. And the explorer is you, you go out into the world and you, you look at things, you discover things. You know, in, in a more traditional art sense, this would be like going to a museum. And, and looking at and being inspired, right? Or, but it's also going out in the world. Right. In our sense, it might be things like going to see uh, popular cultural events, watching the hit television shows and what the top 40 um, songs are. But to get a real sense of sort of what is the material out there. We're and it's also what you're probably doing now, which is watching the news, right? So um, it's, it's going out into the world kind of uncritically and noticing things and, and bringing them back into your practice. So that's the explorer phase. The next one is what we call the artist or the creative creator phase. And this person takes what the explorer brought in and then tries to combine it and put it together and make new things. And it might be something like, ah, here's the color blue and here's a web app. How do I put these two things together? I can make a blue web app. Nah, that's not a great idea. Well, let's put orange and next to this. But it's really kind of, uh, well, I always think of it as a very playful phase. Um, yeah, there's, you're just experimenting. There's one that I've been like turning around in my head, which is like Trump and Citizen Kane and the, snow, and the rosebud sled. And I don't know, it's just like, yeah, these things are related. I haven't really figured out how it works yet. But that's, that's the process, right? It's like, we take these different pieces and we try to put them together. The next one um, is the, we call it the critic or the judge, right? What the critic or the judge does is take what the artist put together and says, okay, is this worthwhile? And, you know, when I, whenever I take my rosebud sled idea, Citizen Kane, Donald <laughs> Trump thing, to the critic in my mind, I'm like, no, that's stupid. You've got nothing, right? I think my first response when you sent it to me was like, huh? <laughs> and so, so it's like I need to go back to the art, artist phase and work on it some more. But um, this, this is like the threshold that says, okay, we're going to work on this or this needs to be worked on more. This needs to be developed more. Um, go back and look at it again. The last one is uh, what we call the activist fa uh, role or, or worker bee, right? And if the critic says, hey, this is a good project, the activist then kicks in and gets it done, right? So this is the the person that stays up all night and breaks it, breaks open their piggy bank to get it done. They just make sure it happens unquestioningly. And the key in the creative process is that we need to actually go through all of these. Um, and we can go through all of these ourselves if we're working collectively. Um, we all know that some people in our group might be better at one stage or another stage. Um, but you it's probably um, imagine who the good critic is that you know. Yeah, exactly. And also the, the person who just likes to play with stuff. Um, or the part of you that just likes to play with stuff. And or the, the person who's the, the like, really ready-to-go activist one that's telling you now, we need to get out in the streets, you know. Exactly. So it can be either different parts of yourself or it can be different people in your organization. Um, Walt Disney, who had a version of this, actually built different rooms. Um, and his creative team would actually move from one room to another room to another room for different phases of this process. So maybe you can subdivide your room up into four little quadrants and move from one area to another. But the key is to give time and space for each of these activities and don't move through them, through them too fast. And very importantly, 
don't get them out of order. So yeah, that's the first problem, which Steve could talk about for a second, is uh, getting these out of order. Okay. And the idea here is that we all have been in a meeting or a room where you introduce an idea, and then some person sits back and says, well, you know, we tried that in 1984, and that doesn't work. Um, and that person might actually be you in the back of your head, right? But uh, the problem with have putting the critic, for example, too quick is it doesn't give us time to actually be open to the world, open to the possibilities of things which are out there, and then get to play with them. It shuts down the creative process way too fast. So some of this might be happening now, right, where you're reading the news and the, this critic voice either internally or, or coming in your house or among your colleagues or whatever. It's like, everything's bad. This is all terrible, right? And like, yeah, it might be, but... In, if for us to develop ideas, we need to sort of just be open and figure out what's going on. And the problem can also be that, you know, not that the critic comes too soon, but that, say, the activist comes too soon. And I think that's the moment a lot of us feel right now, which is like, I just want to go out in the street and do something. I don't care what it is, I just want to go do it. And that's actually a good impulse. Um, partially it's a good impulse because we just got to get our bodies out there and so we don't wallow in sort of misery and despair and confusion. But it also is dangerous insofar as we have a limited amount of energy. This is a long haul. We need to know why we're out there. We need to use the reserves we have as wisely as possible. But sometimes, Steve, you've talked about things like the explorer or the artist actually coming too early or too late. Yeah, so um, you know, if you're if you're if you do the thing, and then maybe what, a good example would be having the critic happen too late, where you do a project and then start to look at it and be like, wait, why did we do this? What were we trying to accomplish? And so this critic voice, all of these are key, and they're key, and it's key that they're done well and they're brought in at the right moment. So as why are we telling you this? As you're meeting with people and organizing around this election figure out where you're at and the different voices in the room and try to structure it a bit so that it can encourage the most creativity that you can um, because we're going to need it. Um, the other problem we wanted to talk about is over or under emphasizing each stage. Yeah. And so we all, yeah, just we all know, for example, I think the explore phase is, a, is one that we get caught in often, maybe not at this moment of, you know, urgency, but in my world, sort of an academic world, this usually manifests itself in terms of read another book. There's always another book you can read. You don't really need to actually do anything with it. Just read another book. What um, we need to do now is look at how Hitler rose to power. And there's a 10-part, 10-volume uh, history that you've got to read right now. Exactly. And so, um, or you can underemphasize it, which is we don't have time to actually just fool around. We need to move straight to action. Um, and both underemphasis or overemphasis on any of these can actually just keep you where you are, it kind of stops the process in the place, or it pushes you to another level before you're ready. Now, you might be wondering, okay, how do you do it well? Um, and that is the art form, navigating yeah. these stages and figuring out how to balance it and, and to get them right, uh, in the right order, to move from one to the next at the right stage, and to have the right emphasis on each that's the, that's the trick, right? And so you're going to make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time with it. But at least when that process is articulated, you have a better chance of navigating it well. Yeah, and again, these aren't real. Um, insofar as they're just analytic categories that help us organize our thinking and our process. Um, there's nothing about an explorer, an artist, a critic, or activist which actually exists out there. But it does help us to make sense of our process because otherwise you can just start kind of dive in and get overwhelmed and we found this really useful as a way to sort of order our processes um, and try to think about are we moving through all the necessary aspects in creativity in order to get the maximum impact another thing i'll say and this is this is a, a little darker and psychological, but sometimes we do this wrong as a way of protecting ourselves from doing the hard work that's needed. Particularly jumping into the critic really fast. Um, we've met more people who have justified not doing anything by talking about the problems. You know, I'm going to problematize that. Um, 
well, let's think about all the ramifications of that and all the ethical consideration, considerations of it. Well, let's talk at it to death. And then we find out that the easiest thing to do is do nothing at all. So I, I think from that, I'm going to move on to uh, another idea where we were talking about uh, problem thinking versus outcome thinking. And, and Steve and I talk a lot about this idea of a uh, horizon that we're, we're working towards. Like, what, what's, what is the world that we want right now? Right, where, where Trump has been elected the president. Yeah. And it's, it's really easy to actually dwell on Trump um, because it's so obviously a problem and dwell on the voices that Trump channeled and the hate that Trump has unleashed. And we should be looking at that. We always need to be looking at the problems. But the problem with problem thinking is if you're only thinking about the problems, those problems end up essentially determining our capacity to imagine anything else. That is, we just focus on the problem. Uh, Steve, you want to talk about motorcycle riding? Yeah, so I drew a little picture here. This is us, right? And this is where we want to be over here. And this we're is here. Motorcycle, Steve. There's no motorcycle. No, no, I'm getting to the motorcycle part. Imagine, and for the sake of, uh, for Steve, imagine we're all on a motorcycle. So. Uh, <laughs> So if we think about these problems, these big, hairy problems that are in the way, right, um, and focus on those, then we just aren't looking at the problems. What we need to do is focus on this sort of vague area out there of where we want to be. When we have a good idea of that, then we can see the different paths around it, right? When all you're looking at is the problems, then guess what? That becomes your focus. So. Um, so the motorcycle part. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a new drawing here. Uh, Steve and I both just happen to ride motorcycles, and there's this thing that they teach you when you're learning to uh, ride a motorcycle about going through turns. So say you're coming through a turn and you're here, and suddenly you see a log in the road, right? And uh, what they'll tell you in the motorcycle class is. Uh, look, do not focus on the log. If you look at the log, you will hit the log. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so what you have to do is look through the turn. And when you look through the turn, then you can see the path around it. The problem that happens when, with new riders is they'll be coming around the turn, they see an obstacle, and they're like, oh my god, a log, and then go right into it. We don't want to do that. So what does this have to do with the current crisis right now? That is, if we keep focusing on Trump and stopping Trump, what doesn't get addressed is stopping Trump and then what? What do we actually want in the place of Trump? And this isn't just about avoiding crashing on our motorcycles. It's really about identifying for ourselves and others what is the alternative to Trump. One of the most effective ways that rulers have to rule is not to teach us or not to convince us that their way of understanding the world, their way of ordering the world is the best way. It's to convince us that there is no alternative. Margaret Thatcher very famously, that was her phrase, there is no alternative. And if there is no alternative, you can fight against the system that is, right? Or you can give in to it, but you can't imagine anything outside of it and other than it. And if we're going to mobilize other people and get other people excited to join us, we need to be able to imagine what is a world, not just without Trump, but a world where people like Trump could never come to power. And that takes a lot of work. And what we're really talking about here is imagining utopia. Um, and Steve and I are really into utopia. And we think it's one of the things that art actually can do really, really well is allow us to imagine alternatives which aren't in the present. Audre Lorde has this wonderful essay called Poetry is Not a Luxury in which she says that essentially there are things that she would not have been able to imagine if they didn't come to her in dreams and through poetry. That is, is that art allows us to imagine the unimaginable. It allows us to escape from the prison house of the possible. And by creating these ideas and ideals out on the horizon of where we want to go, we can start mobilizing people because people want 
something to believe in. That is why they voted for Trump. In the end, for, some people voted for Trump because they're misogynistic, racist, xenophobic people. But some people voted for Trump because he posited an alternative. In his acceptance speech, Democrat. he talked about dreaming great dreams. Yeah. And I think that we have to acknowledge that people want to dream. And we're in a great place to sort of work with people to come up with alternative dreams to the dream of a hate-filled, nationalistic country like America. Um, and what's good about having ideas on the horizon is that it allows us to orient ourselves. That is, so we don't get lost going through the obstacles. There's always going to be problems. That's a given, right? But by focusing on the problems, we just keep ramming right into them. But if we know where we're going on the horizon, we have a way to navigate it. Steve and I have a poem that we like by uh, Uruguayan poet Eduardo, Eduardo Galeano. Galeano. And uh, it's the only poem I have memorized. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, Utopia exists at the horizon. I take five steps towards it. It takes five steps back. I take ten steps towards it. It retreats ten steps. So what is the good of utopia? It is for this. It is for walking. And that's the key of utopia. We are never going to reach it. Utopia literally is a made-up word by Thomas More, put together from the Latin know and place. We're never going to reach it. And beware of anybody who tells you you actually can reach it. But it's really good to have an idea and ideal to strive towards. I mean, that's what Thomas More was doing in Utopia. He created this phantasmagorical island, not so you could pretend you could live there, because he calls it no place, but to knock us out of the present so we can imagine something different. Now, Utopia is really hard to wrap our head around, and I feel even silly talking about it right now. Um, and it's so much easier at this moment to go to a dark dystopian place, right? And artists and activists mobilize dystopia all the time. It's like, this is the world that's going to happen with Donald Trump. And you can just imagine, let's make a sort of an art piece about, you know, people walking and goose-stepping with jackboots and so on and so forth. Or what is the world going to look like after climate, you know, a climate disaster. And this, that's useful, and we're not going to say that that's not a good direction, um, but it's limited um, because it gets us stuck again in a world that we don't want instead of a world that we want. And it doesn't give us a vision of where do we go afterwards. Yeah, we might stop Trump, right? But there's going to be other Trumps again and again and again unless we can conjure up visions of a different world that is more attractive to more people than the world that Trump sketched out for us. And this is part of the hard work that we need to do. Um, so give yourself the time and space that's needed to imagine that world, imagine the world that you want. And it's, you're, you're I mean, we've seen it with people in our workshops where they actually kind of start to shut down and resist it. And it'll happen to you too, it happens to us. Um, but that, that's why it's hard work. Um, so, you know, allow yourself to dream. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we do in our workshops, um, is that we ask people to imagine what winning looks like. And what usually happens, and what will happen when we walk into a workshop tomorrow, which we'll be doing, is people will say, imagine winning is defeating Trump. And that's great. It totally is. And then we play this little trick. And you can do this on yourself, which is, OK, you did it. What's next? And then people will creep out a little bit further towards the horizon and say, well, not just a world without Trump, but a world in which people like Trump could never come to power. Okay, that seems like a pretty ambitious de uh, goal. But what if that happened? Where would you go next? And where would you go next? And what then? And what then? And if you do this exercise with yourself, and it's hard to push yourself. As Steve said, we have a lot of resistance to it. You'll find that actually underneath all the practical things, we've got to do this right now. That out there on the horizon is a bigger, broader vision. And that bigger, broader vision is absolutely necessary in order to give us a direction and also to inspire other people to go along with us. And, and it is what is motivating us right now. 
Um, you know, the, as much as we can conjure up like these horrific visions of what could happen over the next year, two years, four years, ten years, what the reason that you're on this call right now is because you can imagine something else and you want to bring that about. So, so keep that alive. Yeah. So um, we wanted to talk a little bit about where we are now, and I, I think we are throughout this, but um, one of the things I wanted to say is that this is a great time. If you don't know what to do, that's okay right now. Um, staying open and looking for opportunities and being in that explorer phase, well, <laughs> we're barely 48 hours out of uh, this decision. That's fine. That's fine. And it also allows us the ability to create sort of new ways of doing politics and new ways of doing activism and not getting stuck in the immediate ruts. I mean, there is nothing wrong and there's a lot right with immediately going out and joining a protest and marching on the, the, the closest Trump atrocity, right? And that actually has a real function. It's also been done a million times. Um, and what's important about creativity is thinking about different models for action and to kind of slow ourselves down so we actually say, well, what could we do that's new? What could we do that actually responds to the terrain on the ground and doesn't just fall back into the routine patterns of, you know, march, chant, and rally? There's nothing wrong with marching and chanting and rally. Believe me, we're all going to do a lot of that, right? But channeling into the creativity that we all have means that we can imagine different ways of acting politically in the world. But that only happens, because as, as Steve said, is if we allow ourselves a place to explore and play. And I think that's where we are right now. And there will be marches and there will be rallies, and those things will happen. Um, but we need a lot, of, a lot of different ways of working, and we need new ways, especially. I mean, this, is, this territory we're in, we've never been in before. So creativity is required right now. And if you're on this call, you get that, and you're capable. So, um, so don't just think that the, the, the ways that are being offered are the only ways. Um, you can make one, and it can work. Right. Um, and if, if you've been on this and sort of are frustrated, they're like, well, why aren't they telling us a specific thing to do, a way to do it? That's because we purposely aren't going to do that. Because if we were to do that, uh, it might work, it might not work, but in some ways it reinforces this idea of someone telling someone else what to do. The beauty of using creativity in activism is really imagining that we all possess this ability to be creative and we all can actually figure out new and different ways of doing things. Um, and so what we're going to be doing in these webinars is giving general principles, perspectives, ways of understanding so you actually can develop your own tactics, your own strategies, um, and your own campaigns that are going to be unique to you, who you're working with, and the local terrain on which you're operating. And so um, I, think I, I think we can start to wrap it up here and maybe try to answer some questions. So sure. if you have questions, you can put them into the, uh, the little window here. And we're still going to, we're on track here to end on time. We, we respect your, uh, your day and really appreciate this joining us last minute. Um, so uh, let's see. Where, where, what should I do first here, Steve? So let's look at some of the questions. Okay. Uh, okay, so there's some. I'm going to go from the bottom. Um, okay, here's one from Seth Kim Cohen. You say these strategies have worked elsewhere. Can you give some examples of how these tactics um, can affect change? It's a great example. So you want to talk about South Africa, for example? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, this summer I was in uh, South Africa working with sex workers uh, and, and sex work advocates at the 2016 AIDS conference. Um, and what they were trying to do is make sure they had a presence there. And I think it's a great example for ways that we as creative people can work with organizations or if you're in an organization how you can incorporate creative people is that they had certain objectives that they wanted to reach at the AIDS conference. Um, things like making sure that they were, uh, they were represented in the panels that they were being talked about, or that the stigma around sex work was sort of addressed and, and um, they're destigmatized, basically. 
And they were really specific in when they had outcomes that they wanted, right? And there are going to be organizations like this in, our, in the situation here in the United States where, say, like an immigrant group, it's going to have some real specific outcomes that they're working towards. And so when I joined them, it was like, all right, what do you want to do? And then let's talk about a bunch of different ways that we could do that, including, you know, the bringing the kind of arts training or art experience or creativity that we all have, right? Um, uh, like I said before, some of us have specific arts training, but some of us, you know, like, I've, I've met amazing gardeners that, that think in creative ways, um, knitters, whatever, right? So, um, so bringing that thinking and that process to those outcomes. And we had 15 projects that we did. Um, I was expecting, I, I, we did 15 because I thought very few would actually work and that we should have a bunch because I couldn't predict which would work. And the shocking thing was that almost, I think all of them worked and worked sort of above and beyond. And by work, Steve Maines, is that every single panel mentioned sex workers and sex workers not as victims, but sex workers as the front line of combating AIDS um, as active agents, which is exactly what the sex worker and sex workers union wanted to have happen. So it wasn't just getting the idea out there, it was framing how it was understood. So um, let's see. I've got uh, one right here from Rebecca Landis about utopia. She writes, if we can't reach utopia, how do you evaluate when something works? And this is actually great <laughs> because, you know, we're never going to get there. Um, it's really about progress toward. And this is, again, why when, when you think of utopia in the way that Eduardo Galeano does as on the horizon, it's about are we moving forward or are we not moving forward? And so while you'll never say we get there, you can have this sort of lodestone in which to orient your compass and track your progress. That is, are we getting closer to a world with justice? And in that, and we'll talk about this in a later web webinar, is why specific objectives are really important, okay? Because otherwise you can just get lost on the way to utopia. But one of our objectives, for example, might be to, um, if we're you know, working on a world without misogyny, xenophobia, and hate, it might be something very simple like uh, uh, the recognition of immigrants' voices in any panel on immigration or something like that, right? In a local setting, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, you know, Atlanta or something of that nature. Steve, that's such a tiny step in comparison though. I know, but you need tiny steps. You need small steps in order to go these long distances. But the key is we don't know where to go if we don't set a goal way out on the horizon. And so once I've set that goal way out on the horizon, then I can look at that, yeah, I got the city council to actually bring in immigrants in the process of making local laws, and that's actually a success. I can check that off. I'm a little closer to utopia. Um, I saw a question from Brian Doyle. He says, how do we meaningfully explore in this process when the mechanisms for gathering and disseminating information, the mainstream media, alt media, echo chambers of social media, have fundamentally failed us as a society? Wow. You take that, Steve. Yeah. Well. <laughs> That's a hard one. Okay. We mean explore in a really broad sense. So part of that exploration can be exploring how it has failed and how how... I mean, the thing about mainstream media and Fox News and, uh, you know, even Breitbart and the stuff that, that, that fueled Trump's sort of alt-right base is that they are popular. Yep. We don't, we might not like that, right? And we don't like the values and, and it's not uh, even, you know, that alt-right stuff is pretty uh, extreme, but there's the amount of people that are attracted to it. Things are popular because people like them and our job is to figure out why and then how we can meet those needs that 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 that's meeting and do it ethically and move it in a way that's positive instead of negative yeah um, we like to think of it as part of our job as artistic activists is to be anthropologists um, and the worlds that we explore are worlds that sometimes are uncomfortable to us. Um, 
and we do this. We bring activists to things like to rifle ranges. Um, we bring activists on uh, to Coney Island to go on the cyclone, which is pretty uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, and the idea there is to get out of our activist shells so we're not in those echo chambers and try to understand what else is going on. Um, there's a, a, a psychologist and philosopher named um, William James at the turn of the century who gave this talk to um, a group of pacifists, um, pacifist students. And what he told the pacifist students really stuck with me. He said, as long as we look at the reasons that people go to war as absolutely ununderstandable and condemn those reasons, we are never going to speak, be able to speak to those people. That is, people go to war for all sorts of reasons and all sorts of noble reasons. They go for reasons of honor and self-sacrifice and often, for example today, to get out of the town they were brought up, with, brought up in and to actually get a job. Until, he said, we acknowledge that and offer what he called a moral alternative to war, we're never going to be able to reach those people. And so we've got to realize that, yeah, war is bad. But why people go to war sometimes, in some places, are not always for the wrong reasons. And we can figure out how to speak to those reasons. And that, you know, Trump is war. Um, a lot of people voted him for him for reasons that we can do nothing to address, nor should we try to address. I am not interested in making misogynist art in order to speak to misogynists. But a lot of people probably did vote for him because they were sick of neoliberalism. They voted for him because they wanted a change. They voted for him because they thought elites were out of touch. And we need to know that, use it, integrate it, and then steer those passions, those understandings, those meanings in a different direction. Because we can't. Um, there's another good question here uh, from another Rebecca. Could the activist stage come first, but as the explorer phase somehow? Huh. And what she means is maybe getting out on the street and talking to people can actually be an important part of figuring out your narrative. That is great. And uh, again, I, I'll say what I said before, which is like this explorer thing is, it's like living your life, right? Like just being open all the time and taking things in and noticing things. And this absolutely could fit. Yeah. And what I hear what Rebecca is saying too kind of resonates with what we always try to say, which is all actions are drafts. Um, it's all about iteration. And so you do something in part to find out what works and what doesn't work and just to experiment with what the impact might be like. And then you take that information and then you create another draft and another draft and another draft and another draft and see it as a long pro creative process as opposed to I'm going to spend so much time just doing one thing and it's going to be perfect. Um, let's see. I want to make sure we're good on time, and so we should probably start to close. But this has been really great and really encouraging for us. Um, we had, I think, around 180 people sign up. For some reason, we got limited to 100. So I'm going to look into that uh, for the next one. We're going to be doing another one. We don't know, actually. We planned this yesterday afternoon. <laughs> so it's been about 12 hours, uh, and, and, we're, and it feels really great to be able to be of service in this way. And we're going to continue. but. We're loose on the details right now. So um, I'll tell you two things you can do. Um, if you're not already on our mailing list, let me throw that up here. Uh, <laughs> our mailing list is at the bottom. Um, and we will send out another notice when we do this again. I'm going to guess it's going to be in around a week or less. Um, we'll figure that out, me and Steve, later. Um, another thing that we've done, Steve and I, like at 7, 7.30 in the morning on Wednesday, we're like figuring this stuff out. Um, Steve has a book about ethical spectacle um, that we've put, is on the artistic activism site. There's a reading list there um, that has where we get a lot of these ideas from. Um, so if you're looking for stuff to read, there's a lot of really great things there. I would recommend right now a great book to pick up is Rebecca Solnit's Hope in the Dark. Um, as I've, I've told other people, it got me through 2004 um, and, and really changed the way I think. Um, and some of the questions I'm seeing, uh, uh, it would help, right? Um, we also, uh, we're doing this without a budget, and all our budget is project funding, and so we're not quite sure how we're going to pay for this. So if you want to make a donation, uh, we'd appreciate it. If this was like you and us in a coffee shop, 
would you pick up our coffee? If so, then maybe you make that donation. If you take us out to dinner and we'd have this conversation, then maybe you, you donate at the dinner level. Um, it's up to you and it's not uh, required. Um, the other thing, if you're hungry in the meantime, we did a podcast series uh, last year. We did 10 of them where we explored pop culture and figured out what we could use, kind of what we were talking about at the end here. And we will send you out uh, an email tomorrow with a recording of this webinar and um, some of those links. Um, so I think that's everything. Steve, do you have anything else? No, I think, well, we have a lot. Um, we yeah. all have a lot. But let's uh, take it one step at a time. Marching towards utopia, this is the first step. Yeah, thanks again for joining us, and um, we look forward to the next one. And, uh, you know, I actually don't know what to say that's encouraging right now. <laughs> Stay creative. There's time to mourn, and we definitely should mourn. And there's time to organize, and that's what we're going to move towards right now. Thanks, Steve. This is why we work together. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Steve. Now let your cat out of your closet. Okay, I will. Um, take care, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.